Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is the second in a series of five reviews that I'm doing on the Super Mario series. If you haven't watched these videos before, then I recommend starting with my Mario 64 video instead, as I'll be continuing on from that one. Please be aware, I'll be covering these games in depth. It's recommended you play them before watching these videos if possible. So with that out of the way, let's pick it back up with Super Mario Sunshine. Super Mario Sunshine released in 2002 for the GameCube. While Mario continued to appear in many spin-off games since the release of Mario 64, Sunshine was the first Mario platformer to be released since that game, a six year gap. The story seems to pick up where it left off last time with Peach and Mario taking a well earned vacation. Things quickly go awry however when Mario is blamed for the graffiti scattered across the island. The plot of A Holiday Gone Wrong is novel at least and it all adequately sets up an excuse for Mario to use the flood to clean the island. That said, this unskippable introduction lasts for about 10 minutes with only one minor segment of gameplay at the very beginning. That might not sound like much and really it's not too bad, but it's a huge increase in time spent on story compared to Mario 64, which successfully opens up in roughly a minute. If we think of it that way, Sunshine takes 10 times longer to get going. To be fair, the premise of Sunshine is a bit more complicated than the average Mario game, and the intro wastes no time introducing the Sludge and Flood Pack which play an integral role in the gameplay. Taking the time to create some context for first time players is fine, but there should definitely be a way to skip these cutscenes. I'd say the moment the player steps into the first stage is when the intro has officially ended and thankfully once it has, the introductions and tutorials are kept to a minimum. Initially, I used to hate that the Flood could speak. It seemed to be the embodiment of unnecessary storytelling, but now I'm not sure I'd have it any other way. It's true, I still can't stand to listen to the thing during cutscenes, but its role is more important outside of those. The Flood is the reason why the game never slows down after its introduction, since the tutorials can be built right into the game itself with text prompts. Ideally, there would be a way to turn these prompts off in the menu, but the important thing is they don't break the flow of the gameplay at all. At times, the helping hand can be a little obnoxious or condescending, such as during the first boss fight when the player is told to pound on the enemy's weak point, but at least an experienced player only has to put up with some of the screen being briefly occupied by a text box. This isn't just a better solution than most other 3D games have managed, it's actually better than most 2D games as well. If we think back to Super Mario World, the little text blocks that taught players about various gameplay mechanics stopped the game while they were on screen. The Flood doesn't have that disadvantage. It's the gameplay where the Flood really justifies its existence since it's used to tweak and expand upon the already well fleshed out movement mechanics of Mario 64. In addition to almost all of his previous moves, Mario gains the ability to spray water in various ways as well as hover in the air. The 3D Mario games walk a careful tightrope between pleasing inexperienced players and pleasing faithful Nintendo fans who have been playing the series for years. Normally I like my games with a fair amount of complexity built in, but when it comes to Mario games it's nice to know that children can start playing and have a blast without becoming too frustrated. I mean, that's what I was doing when I was a kid, and easy games can help players move into more complex or challenging ones later. There's a concept called the skill ceiling which gets referred to a lot, so I suppose the opposite would be the skill floor. If the skill ceiling is the maximum possible dexterity the game can accommodate, then the skill floor is the minimum dexterity needed to have an enjoyable time. The reason I love the hover nozzle so much is because it lowers the skill floor while also raising the skill ceiling. Since it replaces the long jump, I'd say it lowers the floor much more than it raises the ceiling, but there's no denying it lends itself to more situations than the long jump did. It might seem ideal to have kept the long jump and simply added the hover ability, but I don't think that would have been conducive to good level design. If both abilities had been present, then the player's horizontal movement range would have been much too wide. Each gap would have to be massive to make up for it. The other additions are welcome as well, with the light shooting mechanics being used to seamlessly break up the otherwise constant running and jumping. The unique analog trigger on the GameCube controller, which clicks into place after a certain amount of pressure, is put to great use by this mechanic. 
It leads me to wonder if this is another case of the controller being designed with Mario in mind rather than vice versa. This effect could have been approximated with two shoulder buttons instead, one for stationary sprays and one for mobile sprays. But the current method is a very intuitive way of controlling the water pressure which feels exactly the way it should. It's similar in execution to Mario 64. If several actions can be mapped to a single button without causing any problems, then there's no reason not to. I'm sure this kind of button mapping is harder to design than it appears on the surface, but I'd say the key ingredient is keeping the actions consistent for each button. A dive might feel very different depending on whether you're on the ground or in the air, but it's still a dive. You know what the button will do every time you press it. A problem in the previous game presented itself with the Z button, which could be used for long jumps, backflips, or ground pounds depending on the context. It was easy to accidentally ground pound instead of long jump since they were both mapped to the same button. This time around that conflict is removed and the other buttons all behave consistently too. Considering how complex his movement system is, especially in Mario Sunshine, it's quite an impressive feat that Mario remains so easy to control. Although some moves like the side flip seem to be a tiny bit slower this time around, the team otherwise did an amazing job porting over Mario's skill set from the previous game to the point where it feels even more responsive and easy to use than before. Rounding out the Flood's utilities are rocket and turbo upgrades, which are the sunshine equivalent of power-ups. On the one hand, I can see why they opted to make these nozzles a replacement for the hover ability. It's easy to imagine, if the player had access to both the rocket and hover nozzles at the same time, how much this might trivialise the game. There's also button mapping considerations. The X button is used to swap between nozzles and it's likely they didn't want players to have more than two for this very reason. If you've ever played a game where a button press swaps between several different alternatives, then you probably know the frustration of accidentally pressing the button one too many times and going past the item you wanted to stop on. You then have to press the button several times to get back to where you are, only now you've lost track of where you were in the first place, resulting in possibly missing the item a second time. For a platform game, where every second counts, this could easily spell disaster. You don't want the player to be in the middle of a jump and then fumbling to equip the hover nozzle. The only way to avoid this, other than having more buttons, is to limit the number of nozzles to just two. That way, if you're on the wrong nozzle, you know just one button press will get you back to the right one. All that said, I can't help but wonder how the game might have played if the rocket and turbo nozzles were available at any time. If the GameCube controller had better shoulder buttons on each side, then this may have been possible, since those nozzles don't require analog input. As they are now, I don't think it would be viable, since the rocket nozzle offers too much versatility, and the booster nozzle would trivialise getting around the environment in a lot of places. The way to solve this would have been to lessen their impact through some more careful balancing. The rocket nozzle could have consumed much more water, or propelled the player a little less. The turbo nozzle could have been restricted to only work in the water. It's the turbo nozzle which I think was by far the bigger missed opportunity. It's almost never required to get any stars, and even in Rico Harbor, the shines which require the player to boost across water inexplicably use gloopers instead of just allowing Mario to use the booster nozzle. The water levels in Mario 64 had a nice, calm atmosphere to them, but by far the most dull, repetitive gameplay of the bunch. The Flood Pack offers the perfect way to remedy this situation, but Sunshine fails to capitalise on it. In the Noki Bay level, there's a couple of areas where Mario needs to go underwater, but the swimming functions much the same way it did in Mario 64. The Flood can be used to push Mario upwards in the same way he could swim upwards by tapping a button before. There's no way to fall any faster than the default speed, which is very slow, especially noteworthy when you have to drop to the bottom of this massive trench to pick up the star. It's easy to see how the Flood could have been used to speed up these sections by providing a boost, and there's probably more creative applications it could have been used for too. If there was ever a chance to give Mario a better underwater control scheme, this was it. Thankfully, for a game set in a tropical environment, there isn't actually that many water segments, and there's no dedicated water levels at all. I feel like if there had been, they would have been even more frustrating and repetitive than in Mario 64, since they'd have the sting of wasted potential to them. If anything, the water just seems to be used as a punishment for missing a jump. Bianco Hills, Rico Harbor and Noki Bay all have large bodies of water placed below platforming sections for the player to fall into. Of the main stages, Pianta Village is the last one to be unlocked, 
and the only one to feature a bottomless pit. Instead of being instantly killed, players need to make their way back to dry land, which usually takes at least a few seconds, but sometimes much longer. I'm not sure whether the designers did this to be cruel or to be kind. The player doesn't lose a life, but lives in 3D Mario games have very little value anyway. In fact, the release of Mario Sunshine marked a time when platform games started doing away with lives completely, and honestly it's not a concept I've missed. They made some sense in the 2D Mario games though, since those titles had checkpoints and save points which were distinct from one another. But in 64 and Sunshine you're going back to the start of the stage, whether you lost one life or lost all of them. So in many ways, falling into a body of water is more punishing than just losing a life. Falling into a bottomless pit allows the player to start the challenge again straight away. Sure you lose a life, but at least you're running and jumping around again within seconds, which is what you play a Mario game for anyway. Nowhere did this stand out to me more than the poorly constructed mission in Rico Harbor where the player has to get a Yoshi and leap across some perilous platforms. Miss a jump and it's into the ocean, which means a long swim back to the shore as usual, but it also means that Yoshi vanishes and needs to be hatched again. Hatching a new one requires the player to jump on top of the fruit containers repetitively until a durian randomly spawns, which can take several minutes. It seems like pointless busy work to have the player need to hatch the Yoshi in the first place, but I suppose it highlights another problem with the game. Yoshi just isn't all that good. In Super Mario World, he quickly became a fan favourite, and I suppose it helps that Yoshi's Island was a great game in its own right, arguably better than the Mario games themselves. Players don't love Yoshi because of his character, or because of the story, they love him because in Super Mario World he was immensely useful. He protected the player from damage, easily killed most enemies, and could even act as a last ditch boost if the player was falling down a ledge. In almost every single situation in Super Mario World, it was advantageous to have a Yoshi. The same can't be said for Super Mario Sunshine. It's funny because the flutter jump that Yoshi can do would be immensely useful in any other 3D Mario except Sunshine. This time around the player has the hover nozzle though, so the flutter jump provides no additional benefit. There's not that many enemies for Yoshi to consume, he dissolves in water, and he has to be unlocked by grabbing a certain fruit within the stage. Worse than any of this though, Yoshi limits the player's movement options, blocking off the dive and wall kick maneuvers. All things considered, this means that Yoshi has less utility than Mario by himself, a huge reversal compared to Super Mario World. The water based movement and Yoshi both have the same problem. They're small sections in a game which is otherwise about Mario running and jumping on things. Considering how much thought was put into Mario's movement, it would be a challenge to make the other kinds of gameplay feel as fun or well fleshed out. In the same way that I'm happy Sunshine is mostly devoid of water based objectives, I can't be disappointed about how little Yoshi is utilised in this game, considering how little he brings to the table. As for the levels themselves, in size at least they're a huge step up from the ones in Mario 64. Noki Bay in particular is enormous, but a significant portion of it is nothing more than empty space, and the same can be said for most levels in Sunshine. This is at least partially related to what I mentioned earlier about gaps needing to be matched to Mario's abilities. When the player has the ability to hover, then any gap that doesn't require them to hover won't pose a serious challenge. Comparing Pianta Village to Tall Tall Mountain, the difference becomes clear. Both levels have some mushrooms for the player to jump around upon, but the ones in Mario 64 are much, much closer than the ones in Sunshine. Neither of these situations are inherently better than the other, but there's no denying they feel very different to play. This effectively slows down the moment to moment gameplay, since the hover is much slower than the long jump. Where the level design falls down a little is in its reliance on the widest possible gaps and tallest possible heights at every opportunity. A perfect example is in Pianta Village where a tree sits on a raised platform with fruit needed to hatch Yoshi. There's no danger here and no reason for the player to go here unless they want the fruit, but getting to the top requires two high jumps. This is the kind of thing I'm conflicted on, because it obviously rewards players who have mastered the side jump or spin jump, which are some of the more difficult moves, but even as someone who has no problem making these jumps, I find it pretty tiring to be side flipping up every single ledge. Everything is tall or far away, and I really don't think it had to be this way. For example, in the very first level there's a great little part where the player has to do successively more difficult jumps. 
First there's one that can be done without the flood, then there's one where the player needs to hover, then there's one where the player needs to hover around an obstacle. Just asking the player to hover around a small hazard is more unique and challenging than an arbitrarily huge gap. None of these are particularly taxing, but I've missed that last jump on more than one occasion because the challenge is built in a novel way. While the main levels may be lacking in this regard, the secret floodless levels often do have more unique and dynamic challenges. First and foremost, these are an absolutely fascinating example of kicking a player's crutch out from underneath them, the likes of which I haven't really seen before or since. The difficulty of these levels is about the same as the later stages of Mario 64, but even playing both games back to back, I find the secret levels in Sunshine to be much more intimidating because the safety net has been taken away. I'm sure the lack of a long jump is partly to blame for this as well, which makes some jumps harder than they would be otherwise, although this is utilised well by having the player use wall kicks to gain some extra distance. In the end, this can feel like playing Mario 64 again, which isn't necessarily a good thing since the Flood adds a lot of depth to the gameplay of Sunshine. It's easy to look at the Flood and the crutch it provides and blame that for Sunshine's sometimes lacklustre platforming, but I think the red coin challenges on these stages show that the Flood isn't at fault. The time limits and large number of moving or disappearing platforms means even with the Flood the red coins can be difficult to collect within the allotted time. If the rest of the levels had been built with similar challenges in mind, then the Flood could have been put to much better use. In a sense, Mario is permanently overpowered in this game, thanks to the hover ability, so there needs to be handicaps in other areas to compensate. The time limit is just the sort of thing needed to restore the balance of power between Mario and the game. Since these red coin challenges are quite difficult, but still allow the player to capitalise on the Flood, I think they represent the pinnacle of gameplay in Sunshine. Unfortunately, these challenges also highlight the camera issues. In many ways, the camera is a big improvement over Mario 64. The player can zoom out further, it's much less restrictive, and it has full analog movement this time around. If these had been the only changes, it would have been a huge success, but there's at least one more which proves to be problematic. Any time the player activates the hover nozzle, the camera attempts to pull behind Mario. I assume that the reasoning behind this is so the player has a consistent way to control Mario's movement while hovering, but in reality it can often make it harder to move in the desired direction. Since the transition between camera angles isn't instantaneous, and the camera can even continue to move while the player adjusts themselves, this means the player needs to continually change their movements on the left analogue stick based on what the camera is doing. It unnecessarily complicates the process of moving around while in the air, and it means once the player lands, the angle may have completely flipped around from where it was before they jumped. This means players need to continue to set up a new camera angle after every use of the hover nozzle. The secret levels suffer most from this problem, since their linear nature means the player probably won't want to adjust the camera much. No camera system is ever going to be perfect, but I feel like Sunshine was very close to getting it right. Going through these levels the first time, the camera works fine, but once the flood is introduced, the problems crop up thanks to this little quirk. The moving platforms of these levels are conspicuously absent from the Isle Delfino stages because Sunshine seems to have a very strange duality to its design. On the one hand, it makes a much stronger effort to build a consistent world than Mario 64 did. The team even went to the trouble of showing some stages in the backgrounds of others, which adhere to the geography shown on the map screen. If you look at the platforms in the main stages, you can see they're all contextualised in some way. For example, the moving platforms in the first level are attached to a windmill, so it makes sense for them to be moving. The docks are another similar example, and I presume half the reason they even included a theme park at all is because the concept lends itself well to moving platforms. Normally, I really like when a game tries to be smart about its world building, but it seems to me that Sunshine crippled its Delfino stages just to make them look somewhat plausible. For a Mario game, this is a case of mixed up priorities, and even then they couldn't stick to their guns on it. Walking into a cave will somehow lead to a secret stage full of abstract blocks, floating in an enormous room, textured with Mario-themed wallpapers. These two sections clash so hard in their ideologies, they may as well be separate games altogether. Mario 64 struck a much more sensible balance in its visual design. 
Logically, there's no good reason why Mario should be jumping around inside a giant clock, but the visuals of the clock make perfect sense for the stage since it easily explains the synchronized moving obstacles. There's more moving parts in TikTok Clock than all the Delfino levels of Sunshine put together, and it's a great platforming challenge as a result. The world of Mario doesn't have to make logical sense, but the visuals can still be used to make certain concepts more understandable, or at least coat them in an aesthetically interesting experience for the player to soak in while they play. With Sunshine, it's one or the other. The Delfino levels make much more sense logically and visually, but the secret levels make no sense logically and have extremely bland visuals. All of this is to say, I think Mario 64 did a better job because it abandoned the logical side of things, but still embraced the visuals. This combination has proven itself to be very good at capturing the imagination, going right the way back to the first Mario and even earlier games. Rather than take a balanced approach to things, the visuals, music and level design all seem to go to extremes instead. The soundtrack pulls in two completely opposite directions, which sometimes works to its detriment. Walking around the main stages, the music usually conforms to the relaxed, tropical vibe the visuals convey. This makes it easier to waste a lot of time exploring the various stages since they have such a pleasant atmosphere. At times, however, the music will burst with an insane amount of energy and harsh instrumentation. For example, when Mario dies. This sound bite makes me think of a clown honking at the player every time they mess something up. It might be kind of amusing the first few times it happens, but after a while it gets very grating. On the one hand, the music will usually sound calm, like this. But enter into a time trial and you'll be listening to this instead. It makes sense that there should be something with a little more urgency for special occasions, but the tempo is insanely fast and the bizarre grunting noises can wear out their welcome very quickly. The rest of the soundtrack can be a touch samey, but at least it sets the mood well. Delfino Plaza in particular must be one of the most catchy tunes ever linked to a game's hub, and nobody can forget the a cappella rendition of the main Mario Bros theme that plays during the special stages. Another disjoint is apparent when it comes to directing the player. On the one hand, the introduction to the stages now highlight exactly where the star is, which alleviates the guesswork that was present in Mario 64. This was to avoid situations like the blast into the wall mission in Twomp's Fortress, which required the player to pick out a random part of the game's geometry and fire Mario at it. On the other hand, some of the blue coins in Sunshine required the player to spray a very small and specific place on a very large beach just to receive a single coin. In order to collect all of these coins, you need to douse every area at random to have a hope of finding them. To put the sheer amount of padding and sunshine into perspective, consider this. Some of the worst missions in Mario 64 see the player trying to open up chests by touching them in a specific sequence which they have no way of knowing beforehand. This is pretty tedious, but not hugely time consuming. I'd say it's about as tedious as awkwardly throwing fruit into a basket, which happens in sunshine. I don't find either of these tasks to be enjoyable, but at least in Mario 64 the reward is a star, the most significant collectible. In Sunshine the reward is a single blue coin, or in other words, one tenth of a star, and while there's only two chest missions in 64, there's several basket missions in Sunshine. Unfortunately, these things aren't even the most egregious example of padding on offer. That dubious honour goes to the pipe on the isolated island near Delfino Plaza, since it's blocked with jelly, the player needs to get a Yoshi over there before they can advance. But to get Yoshi there requires riding three incredibly slow moving boats, one after another. In the end, this mostly consists of waiting for the next boat to arrive. I've timed this and it seems like the best case scenario here takes about three minutes, which may not sound like much, but definitely is when there's only six easy jumps in that entire time. As if this wasn't bad enough, I had a particularly infuriating experience with it on my latest playthrough. 
Once you get to the island, the mission itself is one of the most difficult ones in the whole game, requiring the player to steer a lily pad down a canal while collecting 8 red coins. At one point I made it to the end but missed the coin. I could have killed myself in the poison to restart the mission, but I was afraid if I ran out of lives I'd have to ride the boats again, so I jumped out the exit pipe, assuming it would leave me back on the small island. Instead, I got dumped back into the middle of Delfino Plaza and the jelly on the pipe had regenerated, meaning I'd have to ride the boats all over again. The exact thing I was trying to avoid. There's just no excuse for the boats to be set up this way other than deliberately trying to stretch out the playtime. It would have been easy for them to double the number of boats by just reusing the pathing information they already had in place, which would roughly cut the player's wait time in half. I think if Sunshine had been given more development time, the team would have seen this for the pointless time wasting it was and cut it, but unfortunately that's not the case. There's a famous quote attributed to Miyamoto which goes something along the lines, A delayed game is eventually good, but a rushed game is forever bad. To imply that any game can eventually be made good by a delay is simplifying things a little bit, but otherwise I think these are words to live by. It's a simple observation, but this might just be my favourite thing anyone has ever said about making games, and it's why I always take a game's delay as a good omen rather than a bad one. Delaying a game means that we, as players, hopefully get a better experience. Anyway, I'm not sure when Miyamoto said this, and although I love the sentiment, I think it would be nice if he followed his own advice. Sunshine doesn't feel like a finished game, and the various ways its length is padded only exacerbate the issue. Of course, saying a game is padded is one of those nice accusations which in reality is very difficult to prove. Sometimes it can be hard to tell the difference between poor game design and deliberately stretched out design. I can't prove that Sunshine was deliberately padded out, even though there's a substantial amount of evidence which points in that direction, but the decisive evidence for me at least are the 100 coin stars. In Mario 64, grabbing the 100 coin star prompted the player with a save dialogue and then the game continued on. This meant that players could grab two stars without being kicked out of the stage. In Sunshine, despite the fact that the player is asked to save every time they pick up a blue coin or nozzle, there's no prompt when they pick up a 100 coin star. Instead, they're unceremoniously kicked out of the stage. It's a clear downgrade from Mario 64, one I think was most likely intentional to squeeze that extra bit of use out of the levels. The padding is just an attempt to cover up the larger problem. Excluding the secret levels, which would have been relatively simple to put together, Sunshine has half as many stages as its predecessor, which ties into most of the game's issues. First of all, I think this is at least partially to blame for the difficulty being overall lower than Mario 64. There are some insane spikes which surpass anything seen in 64, such as the Pachinko level, but these stand out so much compared to the main stages, I imagine their difficulty is an oversight rather than a deliberate choice. For the main stages, I think the game suffers from a problem which might sound familiar to those of you who have watched my video on the Wind Waker. It seems to me like the easier stages were developed first and they didn't have time to complete the more difficult ones. The Haunted Hotel is probably the best piece of evidence to support this claim. It's unlocked as the fifth level, which is the same position the Haunted Mansion had in Mario 64, but while that game continued on for ten more stages, Sunshine stops after only two more. If there had been more stages, I assume they would have become more difficult as the player progressed, that much seems obvious. This lack of content also ends up creating an imbalance in the types of missions. Personally, I've never been a huge fan of the ghost stages, even back in Super Mario World, since I feel like they break up the pacing too much with their puzzle solving. I can certainly see why some people might enjoy them as a break from the platforming, so having a dedicated stage for it in Mario 64 never bothered me. The mansion stage is one of 15 levels, so it's only a small portion of the overall package. The hotel on the other hand suddenly accounts for one seventh of the stage count, double its previous importance. For me, this crosses a line. If the game is only going to have seven main levels, then those levels should really focus on getting the most out of the platforming mechanics. Even when branching out with a haunted hotel, the visual tone of Isle Delfino remains consistent, which can lead to the different areas feeling quite samey at times. The easygoing holiday atmosphere is a surprisingly great fit for a platformer, but it can become a little stifling over time especially in comparison to its predecessor, which didn't even have more than one lava stage. 
While that's an unfortunate side effect of setting the whole game on a tropical island, it would be misguided of me to slander the visuals of Sunshine entirely. In fact, outside of the secret stages, the lack of variety is about the only problem the visuals do have. In the six years between 64 and Sunshine, the graphical leap was enormous and the game is technically impressive in a few ways. The water is nothing short of beautiful, and considering what a complicated prospect it is to render good liquids, it's amazing how well these effects have stood the test of time. There's even a reflective factor to the tops of certain bodies of water, which is in very nice attention to detail. It goes to show that even the most cartoony looking game can benefit from any extra computational power the team can squeeze out of the machine. One of my favourite touches are the heatwave effects in the background, which really contribute to the tropical atmosphere. If Isle Delfino seems like a warm place to be, then that subtle effect is a large part of the reason. It's also nice how the scenery gradually becomes brighter the more shines the player has collected. As this happens, the player is offered a pair of sunglasses from one of the residents, which may seem like just a fun visual flair, but I think they may also have served a deeper purpose. I've been playing games pretty much non-stop since I could hold a controller, and in all that time Mario Sunshine is the only one to ever consistently give me headaches. It doesn't happen anymore, thankfully, but years ago the bright washed out colours made it difficult for me to play. Equipping Mario with the sunglasses dulled everything to the point where this was no longer a problem. It's only an anecdotal example, but I wonder if the same thing may have happened to some players during playtesting. If that's the case, the sunglasses are a very Nintendo solution to a serious problem, and it just goes to show that the feature might seem irrelevant to some, but be vital to others. The attention to detail goes on and on. The paint-like goop has held up nearly as well as the water, and it's great how Mario can get smeared in this stuff if he happens to touch it. Mario himself obviously looks much better to find, and gone are the days of using sprites to represent in-game enemies or objects. Coins in particular benefit from this. There's something much more satisfying about collecting those fully three-dimensional objects than the sprites. Despite all these improvements, the frame rate is also a step up compared to its predecessor, feeling much more smooth than anything the N64 had to offer. Even the draw distance never seems to falter, despite some levels being much larger than the largest Mario 64 stage. Again, coins benefit from this change. My previous complaint about not being able to see coins in the distance is alleviated considerably in Sunshine. In theory, this should make the 100 coin challenges more enjoyable, but unfortunately a new issue has cropped up to take the place of the old one. This time around, the coin layouts change depending on what mission the player selects when they enter the level. This turns the process of getting 100 coins into an ordeal sometimes. A particularly bad offender is Pina Park, where the player can wander into the theme park section and easily lock themselves into a situation where they can't accumulate 100 coins. Of course, you might not think it's a big deal, since the player can just restart the level, but the problem is they won't know to do that until several minutes later, when they find themselves desperately looking for scraps to increase their coin count. It's also a bit of a shame the mission structure is more restrictive this time around, since shines can rarely be collected out of sequence. You would think this game would be even more non-linear than the last one, considering how open and inviting the main stages are. Personally, I think Noki Bay is the highlight purely because it rewards exploration the most. It suffers from the same problem most stages do, where about half the shines aren't platforming focused, but it makes the best use of the blue coins. Most of them are easily visible, or at least placed inside obvious locations, which encourages the player to thoroughly explore every nook and cranny. It just goes to show that the blue coins themselves are a good idea, they just happen to be implemented poorly in a lot of places. On the flip side, Gelato Beach is probably the weakest stage, since the majority of it is just a flat plane with absolutely no danger. Almost none of the objectives here focus on platforming, with the watermelon contest being a particularly bad time waster. Taken out of context, I imagine most people wouldn't guess this kind of place would be a stage in a Mario game. The ending leaves much to be desired as well. The final level mostly consists of awkwardly steering a boat through a volcano, which hardly seems like the best way to cap off a game about platforming. Of all these issues, this is one of the most baffling, since the Bowser stages in the previous game were executed so well. At the very least, it wouldn't be too much to expect this game to have a better final boss than its predecessor, since the technology is much better and Bowser isn't seen until the final moments. Unfortunately, it ends up being equally lacklustre, perhaps it was another victim in the rush to meet the release date. 
All I can say is it's a good thing Mario isn't reliant on its story, given the horribly misguided voice acting and disappointing finale. That's my boy. Well put, son. The Royal Koopa Line is as strong as ever. But for now, let's just rest a while. Super Mario Sunshine is a very polished game. In fact, I'd say it's probably the most polished, half-finished game ever made. If truly skillful game design comes from attention to detail, then I genuinely believe that Sunshine's gameplay mechanics could be taught to aspiring developers as a top-notch example. The joy in playing Sunshine comes from the many different facets and uses of Mario's movement and skills. The one second delay on the rocket nozzle which adds that little element of timing, the way water can be laid down in front of Mario to make a path for him to slide on, the very slight vertical boost that happens when the player uses the hover nozzle, the spin jump with its slowed descent, the list goes on and on. Lots of big budget games have a habit of getting the basics of their genre right, but then neglecting the details that can really take it to the next level of polish. Mario Sunshine is the opposite. It's a game that gets the details right and the big picture completely wrong. Any idiot could tell you that a Mario game needs levels with lots of things to jump around on and pitfalls to avoid, but for some reason Sunshine seems really lacking in that regard. It's a shame that such a large portion of stars are acquired through filler material, coin hunts and non-platforming challenges, because when it does focus on the platforming, it feels very good to play. I suppose the silver lining is that much of the stuff I've complained about in this video isn't really necessary just to get to the end of the game. The good stuff is mostly front-loaded, and the bad stuff is mostly hidden away for completionists to discover. This ironically makes Mario Sunshine into a game I'm often very eager to revisit, but just like going on vacation, it's not too long before I want to go home again. In the next video, we'll be launching into Super Mario Galaxy, so I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for watching.